You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. Hi, and thank you for joining us on another episode of Two Guys and a Lot of Wine. I'm Bobby P. And I'm James Kimbrough. And tonight, Bob and I are going to be discussing black label wines. Which I think a lot of our viewers want to be, know what exactly that means, because there's a lot of wines on the table tonight. We've got a huge lineup tonight. I hope we can drink our way through all these. Uh, this is a trend that I noticed a couple of years ago, and I wanted to get it on the show a lot sooner than this, but we've had so many other great topics to put on the show. I, I couldn't squeeze it in until tonight. But I'm glad we finally got to it. This is going to be some great wines we're having tonight. And I'm assuming black label just means it's, it's uh, a step above some of the labels that we're familiar with, but it's just a different version of the same wine. It's a little different. I'm not even going to qualify it as saying a step above. It's just different. Different. And this is driven by a couple of different factors. Um, you know, some of this is marketing, but some of this is a totally different winemaking style. And we'll discuss all of that during the show here tonight. Uh, but as you can see, we've, we've got a huge collection. We're going to start off with the Mark West Dark. Um, now this is a little different from the regular Mark West Pinot Noir. And we've had, uh, I, you know, when I do wine parties all the time, uh, people are bringing Mark West. Yeah, everybody you see brings it everywhere. Mark. Absolutely. Yep. Huge, hugely popular Pinot Noir. Um, I don't drink it a lot myself just because it ends up at my parties, you know, when sure, I, I you, have other people. You're over. like me, you always want something different. But. And there, yeah, there's so many other great Pinot Noirs out there. Um, the dark is a little bit different, and it's, you know, this is, it's driven by, uh, some of this was driven by the marketing they're trying to do to the millennial generation. You know, millennials are just now starting to buy wine, and when they did market research, uh, winemakers found out, you know, millennials want a different kind of label. They wanted something, they didn't want to rely on the traditional vineyard history, uh, the area that the wine comes from. They wanted to have something that kind of grabbed these people, and so they, uh, they figured out that, you know, these people gravitated towards labels that were black, uh, sometimes had a little bit of red lettering on it, sometimes had a um, uh, macabre theme to it or an interesting story behind the title. So that's when you saw you know, Besieged, Carnivore, Vampire, all those crazy new labels come out. You know, it's funny you should mention that because I, when I was doing some research myself, what they're looking for is, I think, brooding, yeah. uh, mysterious, yep. and what was the third one that was dark. Yeah. Right. So typical millennial style, they want to just mix it up a little bit, go with something based on title. Exactly. And that's, yeah. so that's, that's the marketing component of this. But that's not the whole story. Uh, the other part of this is the winemaking style. This is a little different from your typical wine, uh, especially when you're talking about the, the Mark West Pinot Noir. They, this is made using the method, uh, the French method, Sanguine. Yep. And it's, it's a method where they, they start the maceration process and then they pull out some of the juice almost immediately. The lighter colored juice, yeah, yes. Yeah, so it's, you know, it, it mixes in uh, and, and gets a little bit of color and then they pull it out and then they'll let the maceration process continue, but the ratio is different. The, the, there's more skins and, and less juice. And so that creates a, a much more intense wine. You get a lot more body, you get a darker color. And so, that's what you're tasting now. Yeah, I mean, we poured a little ahead of time because we have so many bottles. Now, is the Mark West going to be our most full-bodied wine tonight? Is that, or is it? Is I, I think when we get, get down to the gnarly head, that's going to be the, the most full-bodied. So even though these are all full-bodied wines, this is the lighter full-bodied wine. Yeah, and, and we're moving up there. It's partially spectrum. because this is the Pinot Noir grape. Uh, this one and the Irony are both 100% Pinot Noir, and then you get into some blends after that. Well, this has an interesting aroma right off the bat. It's got a great nose. And when you look at it in the glass, you know, it's, you can tell it's a lot darker than your typical Mark West Pinot Noir. You know, those, uh, you know that's, that's more in the Burgundian style. Um, it's a lighter color. It's a lighter body. 
you know, when you make this with the, the Sanguine method, you get a darker color, you get a lot more body. I, I notice it opens up more after you take the first swallow. I mean, you get a lot of character early on. Um, it's a smooth wine. I don't think the tannins are that strong in this. Not with this one, no. Um, but I noticed a second or two after I took my sip, I'm still feeling it inside. But mildly, mildly. Mm -hmm. I like it. I mean, I, th I think there's blackberry yeah. in there a little bit. Yeah, a little, a little blackberry, blackberry, some plum. Very jammy. It's Even though it's you're watching this show, this show with Aaron May, it's, it's springtime. These are This would still be a good summer spring wine. It's light enough that you could drink this yeah. in the summertime. And even if you're not, if you're in an air-conditioned place and you're having some red meats or stuff like that, I think all these reds are going to pair well with meat tonight. That's, uh, and that's the recommendations that I got, too, the pairing recommendations. Uh, these, these hold up well to, to meats, to chicken, uh, stuff off the barbecue. You know. And the price points we're looking at tonight? Price points for these, all in the 8 to $12 range, uh, with the exception of, I think the gnarly head was around 15 or so. It's going to depend on where you buy it. But. Well, that's interesting. I thought they might be just a tad bit higher. The, and, I, was, I was surprised how affordable they are. Uh, for well, you know why? Because millennials, you know, most of them are still living at home. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, they, they got to spend their money wisely. And uh, if they're going to buy wine, they got to keep it in that price point, I think. These are, these are all still great values. Um, you know, and, and when you looked at the market research for millennials, they, they were used to paying, you know, six, seven, eight bucks a bottle. And so this is a step up for them. Yeah. And that's, but that's the way it goes for, for every generation. You know, you start off drinking the cheap stuff and then you move up a little and you move up a little more. Um, yeah. But once again, I, I, this first one, even though I've had Mark West, I think this is my first time drinking the black. Mm -hmm. And I like it. It's, it's a very easy to drink wine. Um, there's enough character in there for, I think, even an a experienced wine drinker to not thumb their nose at or anything. That's still a very good tasting wine. I can't see this wine offending anyone's palate. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. smooth. Uh, it's not velvety. And we're probably going to taste a couple others tonight that are velvety. Uh, but it's it's very easy drinking. It is very easy drinking, and I'm very happy that uh, my first experience with this was on this show instead of taking a chance and ordering it at a restaurant or just buying mm -hmm. it on my own. So, Jimmy did good. All did right. Good. So that was a good one. Two thumbs up for that, that one, huh? And this is all these are available locally. Yes, you'll. I mean, these these all have great national distribution. You'll you should find all these very easily. Now I'm really looking forward to the next one because irony. It's a great name, the irony of the wine. <laughs> I'm very curious to see the color difference that the first one we just Just had. as dark as the first it one? It is about the same, yes. Now, Irony, just like Mark West, has a regular Pinot Noir. Uh, I've poured this at tastings throughout the Boston area on numerous occasions. Uh, I've poured the Irony Dark twice, and people loved it. It's so much more intense than the regular Pinot Noir. Uh, it's, it's, they just cram so much fruit flavor into this. You know, it's funny. I don't get a, as big of aroma as I did with the Mark West, okay. but it could be the glass, too. I get a more pronounced fruit flavor with this, though. Up front. Mm -hmm. Up front. You, you definitely get a little bit more. Um, it's soft, though. Yeah. It is softer than the Mark West, I think. But it dies off quicker. I think the Mark West had a, a longer finish. Which, you know, I think is important because, uh, you know, a lot of times, once again, spring is here. Summer's coming. You don't want, you want the wine to sort of drop off relatively quickly if you're drinking this outside or if it's kind of warm. You don't really want that whole jammy filling in your mouth, do you? I don't. I personally, I, I like a very long finish. You do. I have an appreciation for wines that just go and go and go. Like your women. That's yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that, Jim. But yeah, this is another example of a, a wine that, if these we were doing a blind tasting here, both these wines we just tasted. I mean, I wouldn't have guessed the price point of these at all. I wouldn't have guessed the price point, and I wouldn't have guessed that they're Pinot Noir. They're so intense. You know, you could be right. I might have got that only because it it. The finish relatively is quick, and it's it's not as full body to say Cabernet Sauvignon or something like that. But uh, um, I think I like this one just a tad bit better, only because the finish is much quicker. Mm -hmm. I think we're gonna have to find a favorite for everyone tonight. Every palate out there. Now the irony you said is available in something other than black. Yeah, they make a regular version. Uh, I didn't bring the, the regular bottle tonight. I, I brought the regular Mark West and the regular Cupcake and the regular Menage a Trois. Uh, and we haven't done the regular Irony before. No, we haven't. Not on the show, no. Yeah. So one thing I'm, I'm curious about when you're looking at the labels, because a lot of, is labels still important now? Is that a big marketing tool? Because a lot of these labels are pretty nice. So do they, do they think that putting a label on that sort of, are they gearing the label towards the millennial I, th I think that's part of, yeah, they're, they're, 
this has two prongs to it, and part of it's the winemaking style. They're trying to create a whole different kind of wine, and at the same time, you know, they're they're marketing it towards the millennials, and and not relying on the history of the vineyard, the history of the family making yeah. the wine. Uh, you, you don't see that here. You don't see. Oh, you know, we've we've owned a vineyard for 250 years on the back of these bottles. So, do we dare say that? Sometimes people might buy a bottle based solely on the label. Oh, absolutely. That oh. happens all the time. Is that good though? I, no, I, I always tell people, try it before you buy it. You know, don't judge the wine by its label. Um, but a lot, of, you know, a lot of times people just run in and grab a bottle that looks cool and then they buy it and walk out the door. Oh, especially with some of the titles, like of course, Menage a Trois. You know, people want to buy that to think that that's where the evening might end up sometimes. <laughs> so, you know, but I've always liked that one anyways in regards to their flavor. But once again, I've never had this version of it. Well, the, yeah, up. the Menage a Trois has been one of my favorites too. And I, uh, it's one of those wines that I worked into my, my regular routine and drank fairly frequently. And then because I'm trying so many different wines all the time, it, it finally fell out of the rotation, unfortunately, because it was a great wine. Um, but the, the Midnight came out, and, uh, and it was time to take another look at Menage a Trois. I think the last time we had Menage a Trois, not this version on the show, was probably our Valentine's show a few seasons back. We were with doing the Risqué Reds. With the Risqué yes. Reds. Yeah. And uh, it, once again, I, I've never been a big proponent of, you know, kind of gimmicky titles. But th this is an example where it, it's a fun name, but at the same time, it's still a very good wine. But it also is kind of a play on the original winemaker wanting to, blend. to put three grapes in yeah. here. And the original one was uh, Zinfandel and Merlot and a little bit of Cab. It was 45% uh, Zinfandel, 35% Merlot, 20% Cab. Yep. This one is mostly Merlot. It's 49% Merlot um, and then a little bit of Cab, uh, some Petit Verdot and Petit Syrah. And this is aged in both French and American oak, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, so this is, it's not a true menage a trois because they actually put four grapes into this one. What's the word for four-way? <laughs> uh, You're turning this into a yeah, whole different, a whole kind different of show. Kind of show. <laughs> but it's interesting that they still call it that when they're, they're actually yeah. four different Well, they've, they have expanded the menage a trois lineup. Uh, they actually have a Sauvignon Blanc, which is 100% Sauvignon Blanc. So it's, oh, it's I don't think I've had that. Yeah. Is it good? It's, uh, yeah, it is. Is it yeah. more on the Marlboro side or is it a little bit yeah. more on the... Yeah, and you and, I, you, know, you and I love Sauvignon Blanc, so I, uh, maybe that's one we should bring on for a future show. And the price point's relatively the same? Sa same price point, yeah. Now this yeah. one, it looks like it has much heavier legs than the first two. It's, yeah, and again, is it's... Is that the Zin in there, That's probably? the Zin, uh, and then the darker color comes from the Petit Verdot. Yeah. Great nose on this. Oh, that's, a, that's, that's really good. You know what, you probably can't see it. I have some Korean meatballs, which I thought might go with some of these red wines tonight. This might be one, or should we go through the reds first before we even try the meatballs? Let's, yeah, let's go through the reds but first. My mouth starts craving meat when you have this wine. Yeah. It's just like, yeah, I gotta have something. I get a little cinnamon with this too. Just a, yeah, just there's a little bit, cinnamon just there. Just a bit of spice. But it's, it's still a very mild aroma. And it's, you know, it's not like those big overpowering cabs that you get from California where you get, you do get a lot of the fruit that we're getting here, but you also, you know, they, they just kind of smack you. And this one is so subtle. It's, uh, and this is under, this is under $12 usually, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, it's around, depending on where you buy it. Yeah, it's going to be, you know, 10, 12. So just so I think our viewers understand what we're talking about, when we're talking about the black label wines, the regular version of this isn't quite as full bodied. So this is a little bit more in your face with the characteristics of the wine or how they blend it? I'm, I'm gonna say that's true with the Pinot Noirs, the Mark West and the Irony. Uh, with the Menage a Trois, you know, that was, that was mostly Zinfandel to begin with. So that's, you know, Zinfandels have a lot of body to begin with. Yeah. Uh, those are typically higher in body than other wines. So this is the, the Menage a Trois Midnight's more of a departure from the original. Now, is there a, another um, maker or is it the same family or is it the same vineyard that still produces these wines or they have they pieced it out a little yeah, bit? Yeah, yeah, no, the, you know, well, the Mark West, those are both the same, the Irony's the same, Menage a Trois is the same. Um, we're going to get on to the Cupcake next and they make the regular Cupcake in the dark. And then uh, well, Apothic and Gnarly Head. Yeah, this is the same vineyards producing just a different ver version of, of their regular wine or a different blend. Well, I gotta say, three thumbs up for me. I mean, I'm really surprised uh, tonight that I've liked each red and it hasn't been too overpowering. I mean, it is a little warm, um, but I'm very comfortable with the three flavor profiles of both mm -hmm. these three reds so far. And I think they would work perfectly um, with parties, foods, and so forth. So uh, good job. 
Well, again, and this goes back to what I've said on quite a few other episodes, is that when you're dealing with blends, you know, the winemaker is trying to, to create a specific kind of taste. And so I think you can come up with something that's more appealing to a broader range of palates than you can if you're dealing with a single varietal that, you know, you're, and you're just dealing with whatever Mother Nature gave you that year. If, you know, if Mother Nature had a, a bad year and the winemaker had a bad year, you're going to get a bad bottle. Uh, when you yeah. start blending, you can kind of tailor the taste for exactly what, the, what you're looking for. And I do want to emphasize, though, that these two Pinot Noirs, you know, if you're going to do a tasting like we do, if you're just going to have people over to drink some wine, do very small pours first because after a while you're not going to notice the difference in profiles. These are very subtle, but there's mm -hmm. a difference in taste. Yeah. And I, the same thing with the Menage a Trois, going from those two to the third, the taste opens up a little bit more. It's a little bit more fuller bodied, uh, once again, because of the, the four varietal of grapes that yeah. are in there. Um, but once again, whenever you're going to do a tasting, go slow at first so you can really pick up those nuances in each bottle. And that's, that's what I always tell people when I have wine tastings too, is just try a little, try them all, and then go back and, and pick your favorite. Pick your favorite, because they all blend together. If you, if you try to drink all at the same time, after you've done the tasting, it's not going to work. Drink, pick your favorite after you've done the tasting and stick with it. Yeah, and you do get palate fatigue also. You know, you taste enough wines uh, pretty soon. You, know, you get into, and I do, I do a lot of big tastings. So you I, do, I you do a lot this, more than I do. So yeah. You know, I get in my 10th wine, 12th wine, and, and suddenly, I, you know, I'm not as, my tongue is not as sharp as it was at the beginning. Well, great job on the first three, my man. Very good. All right, on to the cupcake. Which I know everybody's heard of cupcake. Yeah, cupcake makes the red velvet. And this is a similar cake theme. This is called Black Forest. But it's, again, it's, it's much darker. It's much more intense, uh, much more concentrated fruit. Now, people are going to automatically think chocolate when they hear this. Yeah. And you should get a little cocoa when you taste this. I get a lot of blueberry right up front. Right up front. Yeah with just a hint of lingering coconut mm -hmm. on the after finish mm -hmm. a little bit. Yep. Um, well, that's interesting. That's generally, I'm not a big chocolate guy to begin with, and, and generally mocha flavored drinks aren't even my favorite, but that's good. That's very good. I've, I've oh. been drinking the, the red velvet uh, on and off for years, um, and I was, so I was really excited when the, when the Black Forest came out. Well, <clears throat> now you know this because you're, you're, you're a great cook, what do you pair something like that with? Um, it's you know you got so much fruit there. Duck maybe. I you could do that. You could do duck, but I honestly, some of these wines they're so expressive on their own. I, I like to drink them just by themselves. And we're going to talk about you know you can uh, when you get down the gnarly head you could pair that with with venison. You could pair that with uh, you know, like a meat lover's pizza. Uh, and I'm sure you could extend that to to most of the other wines that we're talking about here tonight. But honestly, they're, they're, these are so expressive on their own. I, I, I just like to have them by themselves. You know, it's funny you mention pizza because um, here in West Hartford or Connecticut, just like probably in Boston, pizza itself has just exploded in regards to small shops, these uh, specialty shops, all types of pizza. Now, pizza is everywhere. And to me, nothing goes better with pizza than a red wine. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very interested if I had my dithers what I would pair, kind of pe what kind of pizza I would pair that red velvet with, though, because it it needs a meat. Yeah, it needs a red sauce. I'd do a sausage. You do a sausage. A little, little green pepper, onion. Yeah, I think a sausage might be better than a pepperoni. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, see, now I'm going to want pizza. <laughs> <laughs> we should have brought some. <laughs> and the price point of that one? Same price point. Same, you know, it's eight to twelve dollars depending on where you buy it. Now, cupcakes <laughs> been around for a long time. Yeah. Do you know yep. when they first started? Is it twenty I, years? I did not look at the history. Um, what I can tell you, though, is this, this whole phenomenon started, uh, this darker, more concentrated, intense fruit kind of wine started about 10 years ago when the Wagner family came out with the Miomi Pinot Noir. Oh, yeah, I love that one. And, that's, and they did the same thing that Mark West does. They, they <clears throat> started the mac maceration process and then pulled some of the juice out and then let the rest of it just kind of soak. And winemakers have been playing now with the maceration time length. You know, it used to be two weeks was standard, and then you pulled the, the skins out, and that was the juice you had. Now winemakers are starting to leave it in for 28 days, sometimes 50 days. So the, the, the skins get a lot of contact with the juice. There's a long soak time, and that just means more and more flavor comes into the wine, more and more color comes into the wine. 
and you get more body. It's funny you should mention Miomi because that when I used to go out to bars or restaurants, that would be my go-to most of the time. Mm -hmm. And that goes back nine, ten years ago. Yeah. So they sort of started this whole thing. Yeah. Today. That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. It's and it, you know, it was they marketed it as a Pinot Noir, but it didn't drink like a Pinot Noir. No, you're not, right. a, not a Burgundian style Pinot Noir anyway. You're it, right. It, it, you know, Burgundian style is kind of earthy and really light, uh, light bodied, light colored. And when you looked at the Miomi, it was so much darker, so much heavier, um, and you and they blended Syrah in as well. So it's not even a true Pinot Noir. So that got some of the the Pinot Noir f purists up in arms. Yeah, they they do get up in arms. I know. <laughs> I, I know a few people that love their Pinot Noirs, and they, they can be a little snooty. So if you know my my take on that is, if you don't want to call it a Pinot Noir, or, or you know if you're a Pinot Noir purist and you don't want to count that as a Pinot Noir, fine, don't. But it's it's a great wine on its own. And, and if you want to say this is a whole subcategory. Go ahead. Well, another winner. Another winner. Fantastic. All right, on to the Apothic Dark. Now, we've had the Apothic, the original Apothic we Red have. Blend on the show a couple of years ago. And if you remember, that was a fruit bomb. Yep. It was, it was so much fruit, but a lot of sugar in there, too. It, was, it was, came off as kind of a sweeter style red wine. Uh, I found it interesting. It wasn't something I wanted to drink every day. Uh, but it was, I'm, I was certainly happy to bring it on the show and share it with everyone. This one should be just like everything else tonight, a lot more intense, uh, a lot more. It is. Complex. I actually, this probably has the strongest nose out of all of mm -hmm. them tonight, I think. And it's pretty close to being the darkest. Close. Wow. That's good. I get more of the alcohol with this. You do get this, a little bit more alcohol. This drinks a lot hotter than anything else we've had tonight. I, be, I probably can't see it because of the lighting, but it, the alcohol content in most of these are probably similar. I'm seeing 13.5, 13.5. Oh, no, 12.5. That's, right that's right in the range. That's right in the range for the wines, be. yeah. But generally, as you get darker, sometimes the, the alcohol content can go up. Well, if, you, if you're drinking 100% red Zinfandel, some, some of those get up to like 17%. Wow. But they, and they drink a lot hotter. Yeah. Than, than most other wines. Yeah. But uh, yeah, usually wines are uh, 11, 12, 13%. Unless you're drinking a white Zinfandel and that gets down to around 8%. I don't, the legs on this one are interesting. <clears throat> they don't seem quite as heavy as the uh, cupcake. But you know, we're, we're, we should be using different glasses. But um, there's, yeah, there's still some pretty good hefty legs on this. And it's got a little bit of tannin. You know, my mouth dries out just a little bit at the finish here. Which you sort of wanted to. Well, again, that's personal preference. You know, what does your palate prefer? Some I, people like tannin, some people don't. I like but it because then your fingers go to the cheese or the cracker. <laughs> so you need to recoup. So, okay, so you need, you need to pair this with something then. I think most of these reds I would feel better pairing something with. If not a full course meal, then like we have here, some cheese, some crackers. But all these are good, what I would call conversational wines, where we're going to be standing around talking. You might want to take a piece of cheese, but you're enjoying the wine, but you don't need necessarily a full course meal mm -hmm. to enjoy them. So to enjoy them, so yeah. very good. And once again, the same price point, right? Yeah, fascinating. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. All right, on to the last. This is gnarly head, and I've had regular gnarly head, and I happen to like regular gnarly. Head. And you know, just like with the Mark Lowe at West, when I when I host wine parties, dinner parties, uh, people oftentimes bring the regular gnarly head. It, it shows up so often, and it's a great wine. Um, reasonably priced? Yeah, reasonably priced. And this is this, the same take as everything else we've had tonight. Uh, they just wanted to concentrate the fruit flavors, get a more intense experience for us. Uh, wine Enthusiast actually wrote this up, gave this 89 points. Wow. And put it on their best buy list. And that's because of the price point. So it's, you know, if, if it scores high and it's got a low price, it makes their best buy list. Um, but their, their comment about this was that it actually drinks very similar to a, a low alcohol port. That's going to be interesting. So I've never been a big port fan, to be honest with okay. you. I'm a huge port fan, so I'm looking forward to this. I haven't tried this one yet. So you're going in here, there's a virgin with this one. Yeah. Yeah, it's got a little bit more of a bite on the down, downward flow. And it's, it's got a very long finish, too. And this, is, this one just keeps going and going. It does. It's probably, you're right, this is the longest finish we've had tonight. But it doesn't burn me like a regular port would. Mm -hmm. Generally, for my palate, I sort of have a cutoff for alcohol content. Um, usually 14, 14.5, anything over that. 
sometimes I, I, I don't enjoy it as much because the alcohol is, is a little bit more pronounced. Mm -hmm. I don't get that in this one, though. I no. think this is really smooth. It has a nice finish to it. Um, a lot of dark fruits in here. Really nice. Yeah, jammy. I, I'm really enjoying this one, too. And I'm, you know, I've only taken one sip. I'm still getting a finish off of this. It's just, it just keeps lingering. You know, it, it, it's one of those things that I think all the reds would have probably benefited from the proper glass tonight with a little bit more openness. I should have brought the Riedels back. You know, it, it's just we have <laughs> such limited space here, and I know we've done the show where, where, where glasses had made a huge difference mm -hmm. yeah. in how the wines tasted. And I think that's probably the case in a lot of these wines tonight. If we had a little bit more an open stem. Get a Bordeaux glass. I, or a, I yeah. think all these reds would yeah. have had a pro more pronounced flavor profile. Um, but I think these actually are Pinot Noir glasses, I believe. Well, that's and that's why they worked well for the first yeah, two. Yeah, so the first two, um, phenomenal. But I think the other four are such stars, they would have benefited from a little bit more open mm -hmm. stem work. Yeah. So, so and don't, don't underestimate that, people. Always try to use the right stem work. Well, what you're saying is they, <laughs> these, are, these other four are so good that they overcame the wrong glass. They, they did. still stood out. Well, you know, I know we've talked about this before, and I think uh, when you pick up a glass with a wider stem and your nose gets in there, you're, you're breathing in mm -hmm. the wine as well as yeah. tasting it. And uh, that's one of the benefits when you have such a full-bodied forged gems, like, or yeah, all four gems here from uh, the Menage a Trois until the end. That's what you're experiencing. So, Well, if you remember back to the Riedel show, you know, the whole point of the Riedel glass was to shape the glass so that the wine hits the appropriate point on your tongue. Yeah. And so you want you know, different wines to hit different spots on the tongue. And the funny thing is, all these wines hit the appropriate price point in your wallet, <laughs> which is phenomenal. Because I've said a blind tasting, I would have put a lot of these wines over the twenty dollars. I would have too. I would have too. And I, uh, everything came on under fifteen dollars. That's unbelievable. And, and almost all of it was right around ten bucks. And if you look online, some of this stuff you can find for under ten dollars. So it's <coughs> there's some great deals to be had out there. You know, in our remaining few minutes, Jim, you know, is there anything else exciting? I know you're really active in the wine business up in Boston now. What's the big trend up in Boston? I mean, what's going on up there? Uh, well, you know, Portuguese wines have been the huge trend for the last couple of years, probably two, three years. And I had, we had the, the Portuguese guest on a couple of months ago, uh, Jose Maria da Fonseca. Yeah, I, I watched that show. I was not, but I watched yeah, it. Yeah, I'm sorry you couldn't be here because he had some phenomenal wines. And um, I'm, I'm hoping to get over to Portugal at some point in the future and visit him. Uh, but I'm now working for a distributor in Boston, and uh, we actually do focus on Portuguese wines. So I'll be bringing some of those on in the future, and I'll announce ahead of time so uh, that there's no conflict of interest, uh, just to let you know that you know, those are wines that I represent. Well, like I said, I, I actually had some Portuguese wine recently, besides the ones that, the ones that you had on the show, and uh, they're very unique profile and uh, I, I really like them it's it's different grapes yeah the portuguese grow completely different grapes than than you see anywhere else in the world and, and that's that's why they have their only unique flavor are the prices a little bit lower or are they they're not? much lower and it's you know part of the reason is because portuguese wines aren't that well known here in the united states so they kind of I, I feel like they kind of have to buy market share by lowering the price yeah but that just that means you the consumer gets a great wine for a very low price and that's really what it's all about, isn't it? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Any uh, wine shows coming up? Um, the Wine Riot will be occurring in Boston very shortly. That's a, a big wine expo geared more towards the millennial crowd. Um, so check it and out. Just, yeah, check that out. And before we leave, I just want to remind everyone, you can watch previous episodes of our show on whctv.com or on, excuse me, whctv.org yep. or on youtube.com. And if you have a question or comment for Bob, friend us on Facebook. We'd love to answer it here on the show. And as always, thanks for watching as we well into our seventh year. And until next time, keep Jim and I in, in your, your wine, wine cellar. cellar.